walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We're trying to save souls. Say so there's a real life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion? Newt Gingrich. He's an American icon, a New York Times bestseller, author, and historian who served as the Speaker of the United States House, a representative from 95 to 99. He was the USA representative of Georgia in the 9th Congressional District from 94 through 2012. Newt was a, a natural-born leader. You could go read his background. You can read everything he does, but he's an icon. He is special. He is an individual, I'd say, has more to do with America's philosophy than any other single person. He has done so many different things, but the most important thing is he's a true American. He puts America first. He doesn't put politics first. He puts what's in the best interest of the United States. I think the world of him, and I'm flattered and honored that he would join us today. So, without any further ado, let me just say, welcome to Newt Gingrich. Newt, how do you see the current political claimant of the American, America compared to when you were Speaker of the House? Well, I think it's much more divisive. You know, in a funny way, Bill Clinton and I were sort of the last representatives of people who grew up under the shadow of World War II. So we really believed in America. We really believed, even though he was a liberal Democrat and I was a conservative Republican, we believed we had a duty to find solutions and work together. And, you know, we, we were the only people in 100 years to balance the budget for four straight years. And we passed welfare reform and a lot of other stuff. Today, you have two really deeply, bitterly divided visions of America's future. You have a left-wing vision that thinks that America is an evil place, that Christopher Columbus was a horrible man because he brought Europeans to North America, that uh, you need to have an anti-white racism, and that uh, <clears throat> transgenderism should dominate every other issue. On the other side, you have people who think America is a wonderful place, the Constitution was amazingly important, that biology still matters, and that uh, men should not participate in women's sports. Uh, and that uh, America has to have leadership that is committed to uh, the great patterns of American civilization. The, these two views are so profoundly different that it's, it leads to a very intense, very heated uh, fight over the very nature of reality and the very nature of America's future. I, I think due to reason it's so divided is we now have different objectives. You know, I'm in the same vein as you were. I remember World War II. All my uncles, my father went off to the service. But we had a difference of opinion, but we had the same objectives. Keep America safe and give people a chance to win. That's not the case now. Everybody's objective is a little bit different. Tell me when and why did you decide to run for Congress and you lost your first two races? Why did you even try a third time? Well, my dad was a career soldier in the infantry for 27 years. And we were stationed in Orléans, France, when I was in the seventh grade. And we went to the Battle of Verdun, which had been the biggest battle on the Western Front in World War I. About 600,000 men were killed in a nine-month battle. And <clears throat> we toured the battlefield for three days and stayed with a friend of my father, who had been drafted, sent to the Philippines, uh, served on the Bataan Death March, and spent three and a half years in a Japanese prison camp. And so you're looking all day long at the price of war, and then you're listening to the price of defeat at night. And uh, that was the spring that the French paratroopers came back from Algiers and uh, destroyed the French Fourth Republic and brought General de Gaulle back from retirement, and he created the Fifth Republic, which still today is now the longest-serving non-monarchy in French history. 
we moved uh, that summer to Stuttgart, and we arrived in Stuttgart the week of the first Berlin crisis when the U.S. Army had gone ashore in Lebanon with tactical nuclear weapons offshore. All of that came together in my head, and I spent August of 1958 thinking, you know, well, what is my duty? I wanted to be either a zoo director or a vertebrate paleontologist. But I thought, you know, countries can die. I mean, things can get really, really bad. And so I decided I had three obligations. Figure out what America has to do to survive. Uh, figure out how to explain it so the American people will let you do it. And then figure out how you would implement it if you had permission. And basically from August of 1958 to today, uh, that's all I've done. And um, I found that in order to do that, that winning an election would greatly increase my ability to serve the country. So I had I had really amazingly bad luck. If, if you just relied on easy wins, of course you went through this as a coach, if you just relied on easy wins, uh, the world would be different. So I, I picked 1974 to run. That turned out to be Watergate. All of my friends said, you know, you're not going to win with this huge crisis of Nixon resigning. And I was taking on the dean of the Georgia delegation. And they were right. I got 48.5%. But I came back. And April of 1976, I watched the morning news as Jimmy Carter came from behind in Wisconsin uh, to win the Democratic nomination. I suddenly realized, we're going to have a Georgia Democrat at the head of the ticket. And I'm going to have to run the best race of my career to survive. I'll almost certainly lose, but I've got to lose well enough I could run a third time. And so I spent all of 1976, probably run the best campaign of my career, got to got 48.3%, so I was down 02 And the incumbent decided he'd had enough fun with me, and he retired. And in 1978, people were not as excited about Jimmy Carter. I ran the third time, and I finally won. But it was... Uh, it was a very long endurance contest. It was worth it, obviously. After you became Speaker of the House, within your first hundred days, you brought forth ideas from the contract with America. I believe nine out of the ten passed, and passed with bipartisan support. How can we get back to a Congress that can work together across the aisles rather than against each other? What can we do to change that? Well, I, I run a project called America's New Majority Project, which you can you can see at the website's americasnewmajorityproject.com. And since 2018, we have been doing polling to find where there are huge majorities because <clears throat> I, I learned from studying Abraham Lincoln who said that uh, with public sentiment, anything is possible, and without public sentiment, nothing is possible. And I believe, and this is why the contract worked, and this is something I'd also learned from, from Ronald Reagan, if you start from the American people and then come back to Washington, you can build a popular demand which will drive the two parties to work together. If you try to start in Washington, you immediately become such partisan antagonists that you can't get anything done. So I would say to Trump, if he wins, uh, and I would say to the Republican leadership in the House and Senate, start with the American people every morning. Make sure that what you're doing is what they want and build support in such a way that a substantial number of Democrats will be with you. When we reformed welfare, which was the biggest single domestic reform we passed in the four years I was speaker, uh, it was so popular with the American people that half the Democrats, literally, we, we split the Democrats in the House 101 to 101, uh, because they went back home and they couldn't say, I'm, I'm going to vote against it. But that started with the American people, not with uh, us. The great quarterback, Jack Kemp, was a, a natural colleague of yours in Congress. Could you talk about your work with Jack and how the United States could return to a balanced budget, which we need badly? Well, I mean, Kemp was an extraordinary figure, and you've seen these in your years as a coach. <clears throat> he had enormous energy. He had great talent. Uh, he was very enthusiastic, and he was very smart. From football hero to statesman, Jack Kemp started his illustrious career with the distinction of being the only quarterback to play from the beginning of the American Football League to its end in the AFL-NFL merger. 
During those 10 AFL seasons, Kemp ranked first all time in pass completions, pass attempts, and passing yardage. A true champion on the field, Kemp led his team in five of the AFL's 10 championship games, winning two with Buffalo Bills. In 1965, Kemp was named the AFL's most valuable player in a season culminated by the Bills' 23 to nothing championship victory over Kemp's old team, the San Diego Chargers. Kemp ended his career with Buffalo after the 1969 season, but his contributions were never forgotten. In 1984, he was inducted into the Buffalo Bills Wall of Fame to be admired by many generations to come. Over the years, Kemp has proved he's a champion off the field as well as on. In his first run at politics, Kemp won a seat in the United States House of Representatives and in 1989 was named Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. A football hero, an accomplished statesman, Jack Kemp, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. He had been an intern for Ronald Reagan uh, when Reagan was governor. Uh, Kemp really developed uh, what's called supply-side economics, uh, which was uh, the belief that if you cut taxes and you cut regulations and you increase productivity, that the net effect will be that you'll have so many goods and services that you will mop up the inflation and you'll have constant economic growth with virtually no inflation. I arrived in the late 70s, and Jack had already begun developing this, and I became sort of his disciple. And we'd go all over the country talking about the need to cut taxes and cut regulations liberate entrepreneurs, and create a very vibrant economy. And Jack had such enthusiasm uh, and, and such energy that he was just, he was a genuine charismatic leader. And uh, he w went to see Reagan. I, I remember we talked about it in uh, 19, uh, 1979. He went out to the ranch, and he was basically going to pitch Reagan that if Reagan would be for the Kemp-Roth three-year tax cut, he, Kemp, would chair the Reagan presidential campaign. And if Kemp, Reagan wouldn't be for the tax cut, he would, uh, personally, he, Jack Kemp, would run for president. And uh, they talked it through. Reagan had been very deeply affected during World War II when the top marginal tax rate was 92%. And there were movie stars who would make one movie a year because they weren't going to work for the government and have the government take 92% of their income. So they would earn, you know, they'd earn up to the maximum, and then they would just quit. And so Reagan felt very deeply that high tax rates actually discouraged work and discouraged investment. <clears throat> when Reagan gets elected, uh, we pass the the Reagan tax cuts, which were really the Jack Kemp tax cuts. It works perfectly. The economy booms, and and the the effect of it lasted almost twenty five years. Jack then decided to run for president in. 1988, and I learned a painful lesson in, in the power of positional bureaucratic politics. George H.W. Bush had been pres vice president for seven and a half years. He'd been standing next to Ronald Reagan. So it was very hard to go to a Republican crowd and get them not to vote for George H.W. Bush because they identified him with Reagan, even though Reagan's policies were Jack Kemp's policies. And even though George H. W. Bush didn't have a clue what Reagan had done, uh, which is why later on he broke his word and he raised taxes, um, but we, you couldn't you couldn't build momentum against Reagan's vice president inside the Republican Party, and so Jack Kemp ended up being Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, where he was very enthusiastic about improving and modernizing the lives of poor people, and I think because he represented Buffalo, he had a uh, an instinct for poorer neighborhoods and poorer communities that most Republicans did not have, and he had a passion for helping people. And and as he he once uh, so I once said to a reporter, you have to understand that Jack Kemp has showered with more African Americans than most Republicans know. And of course, at football teams, you know, it was absolutely true. And so Kemp Kemp had a an affection and ability to reach beyond racial barriers. And um, 
I, I still look back on him as one, one of the greatest people I ever worked with. Oh, he, he was that. What are some key leadership lessons that you've learned throughout your career that are still relevant today? Well, this is this is a place where we could easily swap things because you're one of the great leaders of my lifetime. And watching you work and watching you coach uh, and listening to your speeches, uh, you are, and as you pointed out to me earlier, uh, you actually came and gave a speech for me at one point. I mean, you are a remarkable leader in your own right. So I'm a little cautious about offering you my leadership advice. I, I would say my principles start with thinking ahead. Uh, I describe it as What's your vision of what you're trying to do? Once you are clear about your vision, what are the strategies that are going to implement that vision? Then what are the projects necessary to make the strategies work? And that tells you what you have to do every day tactically. And then I try to teach people the two big ideas. One is um, that it takes cheerful persistence. Anything really big is hard, and you've got to persist. But But in America... If you persist cheerfully, it's amazing how much more you can get done uh, than if you persist grumpily. And then the other thing I say to people is, real leadership requires four words. They're equally important, but they come in a certain order. Listen, learn, help, and lead in that order. And so you have to discipline yourself to start every day by listening to people uh, and learning from them. And if you listen to people and learn from them, you almost always help them. And when you help them, they want you to lead. And when they when they say, okay, will you lead me? I tell people what you should do is you say, this is my vision. These are my strategies. These are my projects. These are my tactics. And then stop and say, how would you improve them? So you turn every person into an advisor. And that was the key to it. It took 16 years. I wrote a book called March to the Majority. It took 16 years to grow the Republican majority and create the contract with America. Uh, and those were the base core principles we came back to day after day. March of the Majority is a very important book because it contains practical proposals, things that really worked. We spent 16 years growing the majority. We spent four years negotiating with President Bill Clinton. The result was that we were able to really get things done. Reforming welfare, cutting taxes, balancing the budget for four straight years. That's why I think March of the Majority is an important book for every citizen to show them that it can be done again. We can solve our problems. We can get back to an America that's more prosperous, with stable money, with real opportunities, and with the rule of law. March of the Majority, the real story of the Republican Revolution, is available now on Amazon. Well, I, you're very kind as of your compliments to me, do, but I never learned anything by talking. I only learned by listening, and listening to you, I learned a great deal. You're an amazing historian with a great knowledge of American history, much of which can be found in your books, both fiction and nonfiction. When you were a professor, what was your favorite lesson and subject matter that you discussed with your students? Well, I think in, in the history classes I taught, um, my favorite lessons probably were George Washington and Abraham Lincoln because they're such amazing human stories. Um, they are so historically important to shaping America. And in both cases, these were very mortal people. I mean, they, they, are, they are faced with enormous challenges and they have to rise to the occasion. And, and in both cases, they do. They're, they're very different people, very different set of skills and behaviors. But you can, you can invest yourself in understanding Washington and understanding Lincoln, and you will inevitably be dramatically wiser and dramatically more capable by just learning from them what they did and how they did it. So I, I, mean, I approached history as storytelling. Uh, and I, I really believe that well, you learn from the stories of life and that uh, that enables you then to get to be more effective and get more things done. Oh, you have so much common sense, dude. If you could go back and give one piece of advice to your younger and the beginning of your political career, what would you say to people who are starting out that want to make a difference in this world? Understand that saving America is worth virtually your entire life. Because if we don't save America, 
uh, the place we will become will be horrible. And so recognize that, <clears throat> as it was with Washington and Lincoln, to go back to that conversation, um, this is hard. It's not easy. It's hard. Yeah, um, can... You know, and I think you probably experienced that yourself. You, you don't get to national championships easily, uh, and you've got to get up every morning. You have to work hard. You have to focus. Uh, and I would say that when you, when you think back to who I was, I mean, I was, I was an army brat. I, was, I had no, no personal money. Uh, I was a, a born in Pennsylvania, running for office in Georgia uh, at a time when there was no Georgia Republican Party. And then I entered the House when we'd been a minority for 24 years and set out to create a majority and spent 16 years doing it. And I used to tell people it was kind of like I lived my life on a cliff face, that I was climbing upward trying to get to this goal every single day, seven days a week, and that there were days when you sort of thought, you know, this, this is uh, this is not quite as much fun as I thought it would be. <laughs> I'll but tell you the, what, you sound like a football coach because somebody's always working against you. That's right. Well, and, and you always have people in, in uh, among your either your customers or if you're at a college or uh, high school, you know, you, you have alumni who always know that they would have called that last play smarter than you did. <laughs> okay, I understand you're a shareholder of the Green Bay Packers. How do you think they will perform in the NFL this season? Well, I've, I've been encouraged. I mean, they almost beat uh, Minnesota in an amazing game where Minnesota was way ahead, and then uh, the Packers came back. They're 3-2 and two right now. Um I'm optimistic. Look, I think they're in a tough division. I think the Lions and and the and the Vikings are really good teams this year, and they're proving it every week. So they're going to have to have a couple breaks, I think. On the other hand, I must say, and I'm watching the games, uh, the Packers' defense has been dramatically better than I expected. I mean, all the attention is on the new quarterback, but the, and, and Love is a is almost he's in the same tradition uh, as as Favre and Rodgers. Uh, and you watch him throw 60-yard passes, uh, you know, you think, wow, this this guy's got a great future. But what really has struck me this year is how good their defense is and how good it's been at, at taking things away. I, I should tell you, um, I, I became a Packer fan. I mean, I, I was not necessarily a Packer fan automatically. But when I went to graduate school at Tulane, my best friend was a huge Dallas Cowboy fan. And so every year he would bet me a case of beer on the Green Bay Dallas game. And every year, Lombardi made sure that I had that case of beer. <laughs> uh, and the ice game in particular, which you, I know you remember uh, vividly, watching the Packers come from behind, watching them score in the last eight seconds. Um, I mean, I, I think Bart Starr may be the most underrated quarterback in modern history. Bay Packers draw first blood. Starr begins to count. Takes the ball. Takes the handoff. Back to throw. Fires a long one. It is complete to Boyd Dollar. He'll go into the end zone. You know, he, he wasn't flashy and he didn't throw 60 yard passes, but he methodically led that team week after week to the best record the Packers have ever had, if you measured over six or eight years. So I am a big Packers fan, uh, and uh, I, I have high hopes, uh, but it's it's also great fun. My, my wife co owns the share and is not quite as big a fan and wonders why it gets so intense. But my my daughter, Kathy, and her husband, Paul, Paul's from Sheboygan and grew up in the shadow of the Packers. And so that they also they each own one share of stock, <laughs> which, as you know, is a joke. Although when I see some of my wealthy friends who own football teams, I'll say, why don't I have an owner's meeting? I mean, you know, <laughs> you know you're, you're a billionaire and you own the whole team. Well, I own a piece of the team. Uh, and I actually think uh, sometimes we'd be healthier if we had more citizen ownership uh, and a little bit less billionaire ownership. Well, you you and your wife are avid golfers. 
What are some of the best courses you played, and what courses would you like to play you haven't played? Well, I'm I'm very intrigued to, to someday go to Scotland and both play the, the classic courses, but also Trump has now developed three or four really good courses, and it would be fun to go and play those. Um, we played Pebble Beach, uh, and it's extraordinary, as, as is Spyglass and Cypress Point. I mean, those, those are remarkable. Um, we routinely, we, we live uh, in Naples uh, at Quail West, which has uh, two 18-hole courses, and we belong to uh, Trump's, Trump National in Washington, which is really a, a beautiful course, and it's, it's, inter- it's a much tougher course. Uh, Quail West is sort of a little bit of resort golf and gives you certain advantages if you're not too, all that brilliant at golf. Uh, and uh, Trump National gives you no advantages. I mean, if, if you can't figure <laughs> out how to do it, uh, the course just beats you up. But it's fun, and it's, it's very beautiful. It's right on the Potomac. Um, I, I would say uh, that that the you know, there are a lot of great American golf courses uh, we've played a couple of Italian courses, which are very different from American courses. Uh, we played one up in the uh, in, in, near, in the mountains in Tuscany, where essentially the golf uh, path the the path for your golf cart could also have been used for four wheel drive recreational vehicles. I mean, it had no resemblance to American golf. And we've we've played a I'll tell you we played a couple of mountain courses in North Carolina that. If, if you're not a very good golfer, and I'm really not, I'm a hacker, you know, I go out and do the best I can and hope that I'm somewhere uh, near the fairway. Um, but when you when you have a course where you might have, say, a 200-foot drop, uh, you, your, your drive just feels so great <laughs> because, you're, you know, it's the, the mountain is carrying you, if you will. Not, not as much fun going up, but going down, uh, mountain courses are amazingly fun. Have you played Augusta, Newt? No, I've, I've walked it, but I've never played it. Uh, I, I tell you uh, what. In the early days, I, I didn't. When I was speaker, I could have played it, but I was so bad. I, I didn't really take up golf till after I left the speaker. So, um, so someday I may go back and try. I mean, it's, it's maybe the most beautiful course in the country. Well, we're going to work that out. I, I, we get some of your buddies, and we'll go to Augusta and play. Now, as you know, Newt, this theme of this show is bringing America's culture back. I think the culture of this country has demised. It's gone downhill, and we have to bring it back. You know, the things that we feel are important, which is faith and family and honesty and hard work, those things are what made this country great, and we're getting away from it. What do we have to do to bring back the culture of this country? We have to stand up for our beliefs, and we have to have as much courage and as much intensity as our opponents. Our opponents think they can browbeat us. I mean, the the best example to me is the fight over transgender males uh, pretending to be female for sports purposes. I mean, the whole point of Title IX was to give women an opportunity to participate in sports and to make sure that resources were allocated for women to be able to participate in sports. As, as you know, biologically, and this, this is where you get into this fake science on the other side. Biologically, <clears throat> if you are a transgender because you've gone through medical and other procedures and you're a male, you have, you have a muscle structure and a bone structure that is just dramatically bigger than a woman. I mean, as, as a statistical average. And so you, you see the whole thing that, that uh, occurred in, in swimming where somebody who is a mediocre swimmer when he was competing as a male suddenly broke the women's record. Well, that wasn't because he became dramatically better. It's because the women's record was set by a woman. And you have the same thing in, in tennis. If you look at the speed uh, at which a male hits a tennis ball and the speed at which even the best females hit a tennis ball, they're not the same business. Uh, and I think that, that that there's a we need to be prepared to stand up and just say that's it's baloney. Uh, similarly, when you talk about illegal immigrants, I'm I'm for immigration. I think legal immigration. In fact, Calista and I have a, a a video which is going to come out on public broadcasting in January uh, called "Journey to America," which is about people who come legally to the United States, which I am totally for. Uh, <clears throat> but this idea that we can somehow have 20 million people come in the country, have no process of assimilation, 
no process of them learning English, no process of them learning American history. And it's not going to profoundly change the country. Uh, I mean, that, that, re- that requires those of us who know better to stand up. And I think the, the great breakdown in the 60s was when adults became intimidated by their children and quit saying, no, that's wrong. Uh, and from that point on, we've had an increasingly dominant society of petulant children, many of whom are now 70 years old, but they're the same petulant child they were when they were 20. Well, we have people come into this country and they want us to become them. You come here to become us. We didn't bring you here to become you. And to me, we have rules, regulations. Let's follow them. I know that I'm an old man. My birthday candles cost more than a cake, dude. But I promise you, I will fight to the very last day for this country to bring our culture back. Well, and you're focusing on the right thing because culture precedes politics. Culture is the heart of everything. And <clears throat> I'm a little encouraged. I think... Finally, the left became so radical, and they they sort of compounded. I mean, they they were semi-nuts, and then they were pretty nuts, and then they were extremely nuts, and now some of them are just out of touch with the universe. And gradually, the average American looked up and said, you know, that's that's crazy. I'm not for that. And I think that, that we may be on the verge of an enormous cultural victory. And certainly, if people go to americasnewmajorityproject.com, you'll see 80% majorities and 85% majorities for things that the New York Times would think are really radical, Uh, but in fact, eight or nine out of every 10 Americans believe in them. Well, I can't begin to tell you what a pleasure and a privilege it was, dude, to have you on this podcast. I've been a fan of yours, an admirer of yours, just to listen to you, because you have so much common sense, and I genuinely appreciate it. Stay young. Let's not give up the fight. We will win in the long run. It is great to be with you, and and you're really one of my heroes. And I think it's because of your common sense patriotic commitment. You're you're not only a great football coach, you're a great citizen. Well, I was an officer in the Army, and I learned more in the military than I ever learned in a college classroom. And I think that we have to have values that we believe in and stand up for. So God bless you, dude and your wife for the difference you're making in this country. Thanks, Lou. Let Take me know now. what I can do to help you. Thank you Alrighty. so much. And he walks away after winning his 100th game as the head coach here at Notre Dame. The reason I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, I was born in this country. It isn't what you have, it's what you're taught about the values of life. We're trying to save souls. So there's a rule of life, but then you're either growing or you're dying. And like an old friend once said, we as Americans need to start winning again. Everyone should ask this question. Am I willing to endure the pain and the suffering and the sacrifice it takes to be a champion?